comes to our new duties as the chair of the North Carolina Hospital Association Board of Trustees with an enviable background in education and experience. President and CEO of Caldwell Memorial Hospital in Lenore, Laura graduated from the Duke University School of Nursing and received her master's degree from the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing and the Wharton School. Her experience includes stints at Johns Hopkins Medical Center, Thomas Jefferson University, Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center, and Moses Cone Health System. She has received the AHA, or she has served on the AHA Commission on Workforce, and is a board member of the American Society for Healthcare Human Resource Administration. She is presently serving on the AHA Committee on Performance Improvement. Please welcome a colleague who has distinguished herself through exceptional leadership and just by being a great person, Laura Easton. First, Chairman to Chairman Hutt. <laughs> Thank you all. It's a true honor to serve as Chairman of the North Carolina Hospital Association and to be associated with such talented leaders. And also, of course, a, a special honor to be the first woman chair. Um, I came to my first association meeting 17 years ago with uh, my predecessor and mentor, Mr. Fred Soule, who's here today. And he was uh, wonderful in, in coaching me and guiding me in my professional career. I'm grateful for all that he offered me. But the first meeting that I came to 17 years ago, I'd been to a lot of nurse executive meetings. And at the break, I ran out to go to the bathroom, and I walked in the bathroom, it was empty. So I immediately turned around and went and checked the door, see if it was <laughs> in the right place. So I'm, I'm happy to say that there are a lot more people in the bathroom now. <laughs> there are not many opportunities you have to stand in front of 550 so people and say thank you to the people that support you, encourage you, and help you in your life. So I've taken the liberty of thanking the first person, Fred Soule, for helping me and assisting me and guiding me in my career. Um, I'd also like to thank a few other people. Um, my team is here. They're sitting at this table. Um, they are an extraordinary group of individuals who commit their life, work, their heart and soul to the service of my community, and I appreciate them greatly. So thank you for coming to support me. Great team. And I'd also like to thank my family team, who are also here to support me today. My mother is here. She and my father somehow managed to raise four children, all who are corporate executive CEOs. And she, I have two of those with me, my sisters Beth and Cheryl, here today. Also, uh, my two sons, I have four children. My two sons are off in college, and they couldn't be here today. They have something else more important to them. And, uh, but my, Two girls, Sarah and Rachel, are here today, and uh, they did not mind missing school to come and support them. <laughs> and last, um, I need to thank my husband of 23 years um, and my chief supporter, Martin. So thank you for being here. <laughs> well, welcome, everyone, to this uh, winter meeting of the North Carolina Hospital Association. It is uh, a record crowd, and I think representative less of me, but more of the dynamic time that we are in healthcare and the work that we have before us. A colleague of mine, a very smart colleague of mine, emailed me a few weeks ago, and she said, I don't know if I'm Gulliver in a strange new world or Dorothy of Oz, but I do know that this is not Kansas anymore. <laughs> Last year, the most popular metaphor at this meeting was something about a man who had one foot on one side of the chasm and one foot on the other side of the chasm. And I really wonder what our metaphor is today. In the, a writer in the Atlantic wrote, whichever metaphor you choose, the horse is out of the barn, the train has left the station, the cork is out of the bottle. The US healthcare system is undergoing changes that are momentous and irreversible. These are certainly uncertain and unpredictable times, and to some folks, I suppose, scary times. This past year, I've had the opportunity to meet leaders of hospitals and health systems all across the state and to get to know you all. And in those meetings, I have been inspired by the fact that you really view things in a different way. 
you're endowed kind of at your very core with a different kind of DNA, a different worldview, a different gift, and that is the gift to lead. You know that uh, you're not in Kansas anymore. And actually, you probably say something like, really? Have you ever been to Kansas? Who wants to go to Kansas anyway? <laughs> no two feet there today. You listen to the rhetoric about our industry, and you acknowledge in your leader's heart that there is real opportunity in our system to reduce variation, to eliminate waste, to increase effectiveness, and to make health care more affordable and more available for the citizens of this state. So today, I want to um, applaud you, and I want to encourage you to be that leader that you are designed to be. And I want to encourage you in three ways. I want to encourage you to stay connected to our purpose. I want to encourage you to drive breakthrough improvement and innovation. And I want to encourage you to build the public trust. So let me start with staying connected to our purpose. It's a noble purpose to be there at life's critical moments. My son is 20 years old. He took a year off from uh, college and uh, worked to learn about life. And worked actually in our emergency room on the night shift as an orderly for about six or seven months. And every morning he came home at about 7.10. I leave at 7.25. So we had what came to be for me a very precious 15 minutes a day where we had a little conversation. It went something like this. Nick would walk in the door, pour himself a bowl of cereal, and Mom would say, Son, what did you see last night? And he'd go, Oh, Mom. Oh, Mom. And he would share, no names, no HIPAA violations, this story about those critical moments. Mom, we had this 10-month-old baby in the emergency room last night. He swallowed a dime. We could see it on the x-ray, and it was propped right over the trachea with the smallest amount of air passing through. The child was thrashing and turning, and we were so afraid that that dime would cut off his airway before we were able to help him. Mom, a guy I knew in high school and played sports with and went to elementary school with and knew well, he came into the emergency room last night with a gunshot wound from a drug deal gone bad. Mom, I wheeled this 45-year-old guy from the triage back to the exam room. We were talking the whole way. He said his chest hurt, but it was probably just indigestion. We were laughing and cutting up. And bam, keeled over, not breathing, no heart rate. I couldn't believe it. And my son's hands were still trembling from doing CPR and bringing this young back man through his critical moment. Mom, we had a seven-year-old little, little boy in the emergency room last night. He had been there for three days by himself with no family. He'd been sexually abused by his dad and abandoned and he was waiting for a put home in a special place. The nurse told me to take him outside and get some fresh air. So I went to my Jeep and I got my football out and went to the parking lot and I played football for an hour and a half with this kid while the social worship worker watched. He was so cute, that poor child. Mom, you have a major problem and you need to fix it. <laughs> This poor old crazy man has been sitting in the ER for seven days. He's so fragile that when I touched him, his skin peeled off. He talks crazy as all get out, but he's just sitting in this little room for days. And I go in there and I talk to him. He threatens to kill me. But he's so old and he's so frail. You can see how each morning I really looked forward to getting up and getting ready and being available when he got in the door. And every single morning, he had a story for me, a critical moment. I was reminded that this happens every single day in my organization. And it happens every single day in your organization. It reminded me to get up out of my comfortable home and go to work. It reminded me of my purpose, our purpose. We are there at life's critical moments for everyone, for the young, for the old, for the rich, for the poor, for the strong, for the broken. 
We're there for them at their critical moment. So I really want to encourage you to stay connected to this purpose. My call to action for you this coming year is that each day you ask an employee or a patient or a community member to tell you their story so that you can keep connected to our purpose. It will guide your vision, it will motivate you when you're tired, and it will help you be the great leaders that I know you to be. My second point of encouragement, the governor jumped into, so I'm gonna build on what he said, <laughs> is to drive breakthrough improvement and innovation. I really wanna encourage you to drive breakthrough innovation, improvement and innovation to solve our problem of affordability. The Institute of Medicine reports that $750 billion a year are wasted in health care. The report further says that the waste comes from unnecessary services, inefficient care delivery, <coughs> excess administrative costs, inflated prices, preventable failures, and fraud. We have to take accountability for the ways in which our organizations contribute to that waste and lead the drive to eliminate it. In my organization, we are part of the Carolina's Lean Collaborative, and we are using the Lean Engine to drive breakthrough improvement. We embrace Lean as a driving force and commit ourselves to a transformational pace. So what does that mean? That means that we hold ourselves to engaging in four or five Kaizen or improvement events every single month, and the targets of those improvements are directly related to reducing unnecessary service, eliminating inefficiency, preventing failures, and generally ridding our organization of any process that does not bring value to a patient. At the end of each rapid improvement event, four times a month, we have a report out. These reports have the same effect on me as my son's morning reports. I am constantly amazed by the true waste that exists in our operation. And I'm also constantly amazed by the pleasure it brings to the doctors, the nurses, and the staff who point out that waste and help us to eliminate it. I'm energized by the changes that they create. They are energized by those changes. The events give us a sense of hope that the problem of affordability or quality or access can be solved. They give us hope that it give us a sense of empowerment that we can be part of those solutions. I want to give you just a really quick example of our results with our lean effort related to preventing failures. In our organization, we call it a failure every time we do not meet in any individual core measure, any individual element of core measure. Prior to engaging in the lean process, we were experiencing about 16 failures each month across all of our core measures. From a North Carolina competitive perspective, we were right middle of the pack. And since we began our lean engine to drive improvement and to create very reliable processes of care, we have only observed one failure or less per month for a year. That's breakthrough innovation. Breakthrough improvement and innovation are close cousins. Innovation provides totally new ways of doing business, and this too must be part of our leadership drive. Innovation can mean creating, spreading or integrating new ways of doing business. In North Carolina, health systems are creating centers for innovation and new executives called chief innovation officers. But innovation is not the exclusive territory of large institutions. In fact, if you read about disruptive innovation, it generally comes from smaller organizations. When you learn from Guy Singer's proven care navigation system, you are spreading innovation. When you explore new partnerships or build an accountable care organization, you are part of delivery system innovation. The North Carolina Hospital Association is committed to innovative leadership, and as you may be aware, has established a new center as part of their strength transformational strategy. It's called the Center for Affordable Health Care. So I have a call to action for you on this category also. My call to action for you here is that in, is twofold. First, in the coming year, I encourage you to share your successes 
related to affordability and innovation with the North Carolina Center for Affordable Health Care. And second, I invite you to join us in our Lean Journey with the Carolina Lean Collaborative. We have some social media sites. We have a page, theleantarhill.org, and a Twitter, at Lean Tar Hill. And I invite you to join us in the dialogue and share your experiences and your successes. Drive breakthrough improvement and innovation. It will unleash the, unleash the energy we need to make the transformation that this country is demanding, and it will help you be the great leader that you're designed to be. So my third point of encouragement is to build the public's trust. In times of great change and uncertainty, people get nervous. They get scared. In our case, they wonder if we will be there in their critical moments. They wonder if they'll be able to afford the care they need. Honestly, they wonder if we're on their side. They wonder if we are a big, cold, corporate, money-making machine, or a partner who cares about us individually. As leaders, you have the unique power to engage and to reassure and to garner trust by engaging patients, families, and your community in our transformation. A number of hospitals across the state have established corporate-wide patient engagement strategies to ensure that at their hospital, that at every point of contact with the patient, the patient knows that they're their partner. Active patient and family advisors serve on committees all across the institution, providing that crucial perspective. When we designed our cancer center, an integrated cancer center, we had two people with an active cancer treatment who were on our team. They spent a week sitting in a vacant building, a gutted building, that we intended to convert into our cancer center with the architects, designers, and the clinical staff. The building had these beautiful windows that went from floor to ceiling. We didn't have much experience engaging patients in planning at that point. So at first, the patients sat quietly and observed the rough drawings as we developed them. As the team reported at a daily report out, someone noticed that the designs had the patients sitting with their backs to the windows, facing nurses' stations and a wall, and the nurses had a beautiful view over the patients out the window. The patients were asked to comment, and of course, we redesigned and uh, the orientation was changed, and now patients look out a beautiful window into a memorial garden as they receive their treatments. Engaging the community directly in conversations about the policy issues that are widely reported on TV and in the news also engenders trust. I am aware of two CEOs, whom I greatly respect, from competing hospitals who did a joint community roundtable at various events over the course of several months. I can only imagine the reassurance that this provided that community. So I encourage you to build the public's trust through engagement. My call to action is that you add a patient or a family member to at least one major team or committee in your organization in the coming year, and that you hold a series of forums, public forums to talk about the ways in which you are working to be there for your community in their critical moment. Build trust through engagement, and it will help you be the great leaders that you're designed to be. I have uh, one last personal story that I want to share. As you can imagine, our household is kind of busy with uh, two careers and four children. When I first became CEO, Rachel here was three years old, and my oldest son was 13. Uh, Martin and I were to celebrate our 15th wedding anniversary, but between soccer and church activities and school and everything else, we had a hard time finding a chance to get away. So I secretly arranged with Martin Fox to kidnap him from his place of work for the day while the children were tied up in school, and I whisked him off to Asheville to the Grove Park Inn where we're having our summer meeting to spend a day at the spa, my choice. <laughs> when we arrived, the manager of the spa uh, greeted us and welcomed us and said that she wanted to assist us in celebrating our 15th wedding anniversary. So she offered us a complimentary bottle of champagne 
and our uh, free Aura pictures. That's Aura, A-U-R-A. -A. Uh, Martin and I had no idea what an Aura picture was, but uh, we graciously accepted it came with a bottle of champagne. <laughs> so at about noontime, they called us, and we went into a room, and uh, they had us sit down on this chair. And it had like metal all over it. It looked like an executioner chair. So I sat in the chair first, and they snapped like a Polaroid picture of me. And then Martin sat in the chair, snapped a Polaroid picture of him. And then they took us into this beautiful room with a fireplace, sat us in front of the fireplace, and they told us about our auras. So first they showed me mine. It was a picture of me, and I had this blue and green aura. And they asked me, do you ever do any public speaking? <laughs> And I said, occasionally. And they said, well, you have the chakra of communication and wisdom. My husband's photo was red, orange. <laughs> they explained to him that this is the chakra of vitality and courage, self-confidence. And then they said, oh, but look at this. He's got this white streak through the middle of his aura. That's very rare. That's very rare indeed. And they explained that white energy reflects what is pure, and what is good, and what is right, and close to godliness. <laughs> <laughs> Martin and I had a really good laugh. We drank our bottle of champagne, and we said we had a great, great 15th wedding anniversary. But a few months later, as I was sitting on my front porch watching the sunset, the hospital helicopter flew overhead. And I watched it fly, fly across the valley and land at the hospital as I can for my front porch. As it loaded, I thought about the doctors and the nurses and caring for the patients. I thought about them stabilizing and packing and preparing them for transfer. I thought about the patients themselves at that critical moment. And I thought about the family that was scrambling to make a frightening and unexpected trip to a big city medical center. <laughs> And it occurred to me at that moment, as the sun went behind Table Rock Mountain and the helicopter took off and flew back over my home, that if the hospital had an aura, it would be pure and white. Because what we do is right, it's good, and it's close to godliness. In fact, the hospital's aura would be a beacon in the night. So, in closing, our purpose is a white light purpose stay connected to it, drive improvement and innovation to protect it, build the public trust, and be the leaders you're designed to be. Thank you and enjoy the conference. Thank you, Laura. Let's give her another round of applause. Be looking forward to you being our beacon, and you certainly are the right leader at the right time for the association.